Well, good morning. It's still morning. Thank you so much for coming this morning. I greet you. I greet the people in the Ohana tent and everyone online as well that's watching. As Tim said, my name is Randy Furushima. I am the Dean and Executive Officer for New Hope Christian College, our Hawaii campus here. Uh, it's a wonderful college, just a privilege. And I want to give um, you first a shout out to thank you for all that you have done to support our college. We're the only Christian accredited college here in Hawaii, and our mission is to the 44 nations around the Pacific Rim, so we're not done yet. But I'm here to tell you that just this year, we're ce we celebrated our gala two weeks ago, 15 years in existence, so God is really good. Let's give God an applause for that. The, the college had some really humble starts, and that's what I want to talk to you about today that I really believe this is a message that has been fresh for me and I wanted you to, to, to know this as well. This morning I wanna to talk to you about something called sacred beginnings. And what that means is that you know, we all have our starts in something. It could be a humble start. It might not be the kind of start that we would want. Whatever it is that you're engaged in in your life, maybe it's a relationship or marriage or friendship, maybe it's your job or maybe it's a new ministry that God wants you to start or a current ministry that you're involved in, but whatever it is that you're involved in, it probably has had a very humble start. The reason why this is so important is that humble starts are actually sacred beginnings. In other words, God is there with you even at the beginning. No matter how it looks, it could be small, it could be so modest, but God is saying, I want you to take this and I want you to know that this is a sacred beginning for your life. So the central idea this morning I want you to see is that God sees humble starts in your life as sacred beginnings toward a lifelong journey of following Jesus because that's what it's all about. I had a really humble start. Um, you know, I, and I had my dreams as well. I was in high school, I was about 15 years old, and in order to get home after I walked home from high school, I went through this church, and this church was the church that I belonged to. I'd been going there since I was a child, and I always wanted to work in the church, and so 15 years old, I would like bug the leaders there. Uh, Do you have any positions open for me at the church? I like to work there. And they said, like what? I said, you know, like a, like a pastor or something, 15 <laughs> years old. And they said, why do you want to be a pastor? I said, well, it's because they got the easiest job in the world. They only work one day a week. <laughs> and even then, only one hour, right? So they said, no, we don't have anything for you. I said, well, can you think about it and pray about it? So they, they did. And then a couple of days later, they called me and said, Randy, why don't you stop by this, the church after you walk home from school? Just stop by because we have a job for you. I said, a job? Really? I, mean, I thought, what could it be? You know, it was just absolutely amazing. And then I went to the office and they gave me a mop. <laughs> they said, we need a janitor, you can start tomorrow. True story. And I said, I took the mop and I said, God, if that's what you want me to do, okay. It was three days a week, part-time job. I swept and I mopped and I cleaned throughout this whole church. It, the, it was the education wing of the church. And the reason why it was so dirty with all this dust and dirt is that they didn't put in the windows yet for several years. In other words, it's just like the, from the, the elements from the outside, the leaves, the dirt, the grime, and so like the dirt was like that after every two days, so I used to sweep it up every day so that at least it was dirt free and leaf, leaf free on the ground so that this, this could be some place where they could you know, have what was called Sunday school with K through 12, kindergarten to 12th grade. Well, here's what happened. A humble start, right? Well, as I was sweeping and mopping the place, I discovered the storage room, so I opened it up, and there it was on these shelves. My heaven, it was all of the Christian education materials for K through 12. This is for what they were using as the curriculum to teach. Now, you have to know my heart. I love studying the Bible, and I, I could get my hands on every single thing to learn what the Bible was about. And here was a whole year's worth of curriculum materials. So after I worked and cleaned up, I went into the storage room, pulled a book off the shelf, a curriculum, and I would study it. And I remember taking a book off the shelf and I was reading it and I go, wow, this is, this is good, but it, it's kind of hard. And I looked at it and it was the first grade book. So I um, <laughs> put it back on the shelf, got the kindergarten one up, and I go, okay, 
and I started, you know, cutting out things and coloring it and all of that. And um, but I, I worked my way all the way through. I covered all of that, and so this is. I said, "Wow, this is where they keep their stash. This is what a church does." Well, fast forward the tape about 20 years. So this is some some years later. I happened to be and work in New York City at that time. Of course, I live in Hawaii now. But at that time, one of the, the gifts that God gave me, I was honored to work with some Christian publishers, and I worked at writing and editing Christian education materials, the same kind of materials that, that like ministered to me when I was 15 years old. And I remember sometimes being so discouraged because I used to take these manuscripts home to correct and to edit and all of that. And, and I said, oh, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. And God said, remember your call. Remember your sacred beginning. I placed it in your heart. This is what you should be doing, that you should be able to do that. And that, you know, sometimes you get what I call the spiritual brain slap in which God reminds us what we're supposed to be doing. And that's what it was for me. But it was a humble start. It was a way in which God, for me, it was a sacred beginning to what it is today. And I still do this today because here at, at the college, we do all kinds of curriculum development and resources and doing that and editing and doing all of that. But it was a humble start and God was with me even back then. And I thought, wow, that's really amazing. The other thing that I used to do was I, um, I love God's word. And I remember when I was about 10 years old, uh, you know, I had this Bible they had given to me and someone taught on this one verse, and I'll tell you what that verse is. It was Romans 8.28. It's not in your notes, but let me tell you what that verse is. Romans 8.28 goes like this. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. It's a wonderful verse. And I remember though, 10 years old, I'm reading this and I'm thinking, when I heard it, I thought, wow, there's something so much more to this verse. So what I did was, at night, I would open up my Bible to Romans 8.28 and by myself just read this verse, just that one verse. That was my nightly devotion, just reading it. And I would take word by word to try to understand what this verse meant because I knew there was something in it for me. So I would go, all things work together. Oh, all things. So not some things, not most of the things, all things work together. What does that mean? It means that there's no chaos in my life, that God will take all the things in your life and put them together. Oh yeah, why? For good. All things work together for good. Really? For everybody? No, to those who love God. So then I started to learn that, well, it had to do with my relationship with God, to those who are the called. So there's calling involved in this according to his purposes, not mine. I thought, wow, that's, that's so like wonderful. I, I'm going to have to read this verse again the next night. So I went home the next night, okay, went, went to school and then returned at home, looked forward to that evening, opened up to Romans 8, 28, and then I read it all again. All things work together, and I would stop on every word again, and, because it was just so much. And this was God, like, teaching me out of this one verse. And I did this, I'm not kidding here, I did this for one whole year. Every night I read this one verse. That's it. It took me one whole year to realize there was such a thing as Romans 8, 29. <laughs> Today, I'm on Romans 8, 31. <laughs> and, and I heard that some rumor that there's actually a ninth chapter somewhere, but, but, but don't tell me that. I, I don't look forward to it myself. My point is this, is that God, God starts with a humble start that becomes a sacred beginning to a lifelong journey of devotion and commitment to Jesus Christ. You know that this church also had a humble start. If those of you who are new or haven't been here that long, you might want to know that, that New Hope Christian Fellowship started off very humbly. Who would have thought that we would be meeting first in our grand opening in 1995 at Stevenson Middle School? And then later on through UH Campus Center to end up at Stanchurf Arena and now Blaisdell Arena for some of our events. Who would have thought that? I mean, it's just amazing what God was doing in the early days. In fact, there are three of us, uh, myself and Guy Higashi and um, Clark Bright, um, and we did you know, small groups and worship and uh, developing and equipping um, some of the ministers here. So there are three of us that were on staff here at the beginning, and we shared one desk that was about the size of this podium right here. 
with one telephone landline with a very, very long cord. The reason why we had to have a long cord in the telephone was that if the phone rang there, it had to go across the two of us, and I would have to answer it. And I think at one point that I actually almost strangled Guy Higashi with that long phone cord. But those were the early days of what it was. Even Pastor Wayne, his office, he had an office, but he had a table in it, and he had a whiteboard. And he invited anyone to come into his office to start working on it. So there we were, just this humble start of everybody sharing the space that we had. And look at what we have now. Who would have thought? Who would have thought that we would be worshiping even in this place? You know, this is called the LEAD Center, L-E-A-D. That stands for Leadership, Education, and Development. Did you know that? That was how we originally conceived of it. This is going to be a place in which people would come and learn how to be disciple, learn how, how to be led. And look at this. It's, it's be turned into not only that, but a worship center for all. And if you don't know this, this bears repeating. Underneath these floors are filled hundreds of biblical references that we invited the church to come and before we dedicated this building all under there you can have you will see all under the floor and and all on the all, all on the walls are biblical references somewhere along somewhere i think it's around here you'll find romans 828 why don't you cut the carpet and see if that's true right um, okay no I, okay <laughs> okay mike <laughs> i don't want you to do that but here's what it is. And what happened was that you are literally sitting on God's word. You're literally sitting on God's word. And what we did was, in the front, we actually especially had verses of healing all the way along here. So right along the front, all the way up to this platform, and on the platform, verses of healing. It's a humble start. That's all we could do. We just wrote Bible verses down and references done all around this place. Who would have thought? This is a very special place. It has this place even, a very sacred beginning that will help all of us together to be on this lifelong journey in our devotion to Jesus Christ. It's really amazing what God has, has been doing. We all begin with humble starts toward this lifelong journey. Now, how do we know this? I want you to take a look at your scripture uh, in your notes right now. The scripture is from Zechariah. In fact, let's read this together from Zechariah 4. Ready? Go. Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. Now, what is Zechariah saying here? There was a governor of Judah. His name was Zerubbabel. The temple had already been destroyed at that point, and God said to rebuild the temple. So Zerubbabel started to rebuild the temple just from its foundations. But it was a very modest beginning. It was a very, very humble start. But what does Zechariah say? Do not despise these small beginnings. Making specific reference to the building of the temple it was a huge project. But they had to start somewhere. Just like something in you. I believe this morning, every single one of us has a small beginning. That God has ignited something in you. Planted something in you. Maybe it's that idea you thought that maybe you want to start a small group. Or maybe you want to do this in your life, or this project, or this ministry, or make a change in your life. There's something that has been started in you. Do not despise the small beginnings. In fact, what happens is that when you have that small beginning, do you know what the Lord's response is? He rejoices. I'm not making this up. It's in the scripture. Check it out. The Lord rejoices in small beginnings. Because, you see, what we've succumbed to in our society is that we only pay attention to the end, right? The bottom line. What is it? What's the product? What's the end product? What is it that I, I can, like, celebrate? And so even when you're building a building or dedicating something, you just see the whole thing and you applaud that and you thank God for it. Well, I'm here to tell you, friends, that God is not just only in the end. He's in the beginning as well. He's there from the very beginning, although you may not notice it and although you may not affirm it, God was there in the very beginning. He was there in the very beginning of your life, and he's going to be at the very end of your life as well and beyond that as well. How do I know this? Revelation 22. Let's look at this. Now, this one we have to read aloud too. So let's read it together aloud and solidly. Ready? Go. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the... You see, it's not beginning or the end. It's beginning and the end. What that means is alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet. So it's like A. That's how we get it. And God is there in the alpha, in the A. 
and he's there all the way through your life, all the way through till he reaches the omega. Omega is the last letter in the Greek alphabet. We would call it Z. So he's there from the A to the Z. And what this verse is saying is that God is saying that he's in both extremes. He's not in either. He's in both and everything in between. So God has been there in your life from the very humble start, from the very sacred beginning, from your alpha, your A, all the way through your life, all the way until omega or Z. That's the kind of God we have. That's the affirmation out of Revelation. So let's not diminish or despise the fact that, that we have this beginning. Small, humble, minute, perhaps insignificant. God is there. God is there. And he's going to be there from the A through the Z. Okay, what are the three benefits of a humble start? So wh what is it that I can look forward to? Write this in. Number one, when you begin with a humble start and see it and recognize it, as a sacred beginning in your life, you build confidence, write that in, in God. You build confidence in God. Why this is important, so those of you who know my story know, know this part. I was here at the beginning of New Hope when we first started, 1995, 96, and after staying here five years, God called me to plant another church in this community, in the Halava community. So in 2000, I left. And by that time, we had started what was now called uh, New Hope Christian College, where back then was called Pacific Rim Bible Institute. And we had started it only two years. And then God called me out, out of the church and out from the institute to plant another church. And so in obedience to him, I stayed there. I, I left, rather, and I stayed there nine years. But I have to confess to you that my heart was so into, into Christian higher education and equipping young men and women for Christian ministry that I felt that I had actually abandoned, sort of, so to speak, metaphorically speaking, a two-year-old child because the institute was only two years old. And I really felt bad about that, but I was trying to be obedient to God, but here this institute was only two years old. And then after nine years being away from that and after planning this church and pastoring a church, there was something in my heart that said, I really yearn to want to, to, to really complete and finish and, and do work that would sustain and grow the institute, which at that time had become Pacific Rim Christian College already. And I thought, God, how are you going to make this happen? And there was an opportunity for me to return and to help in after, after nine years being away. And so I said to myself, Lord, what is, it you, what is it you want me to do? How am I going to proceed with this? And he said, well, just pray and discern that. So, so that's what I did. My wife and I took, in, in the year 2000, a, like a one-week prayer retreat, a discerning time. So we actually... Uh, left away, went to the Santa Cruz Mountains at this prayer retreat center, and we prayed together. And I can tell you today there are two things that happened to me there. The first thing is that God restored to me my original call to ministry. Because in the Santa Cruz Mountains, there's a conference center called Mount Hermon Christian Conference Center. And it was at that conference center that when I was 12 years old, God called me into the ministry. And he used for me a verse from, a couple of verses from Ephesians 4. And I, I want to read those verses to you. I, it's, it's not in your um, notes because I wanted you to hear this. I'm 12 years old. I'm listening to this message, and this is what I heard. And he gave himself some, to some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. And I still remember when I was 12, this was my call. And I remember hearing those words, and I said, God, this is what I want to do. I want to edify the body of Christ. I want to build people up in the unity of faith so they come to that statue, full stature of knowledge in Jesus Christ. And now in this prayer retreat in 2000 with my wife and I, thinking about what am I going to do in this next season of my life, God recalled that original vision and the original call. And the second thing he did was, he restored my vision for our school, our college. Because you see, I had felt bad about abandoning this two-year-old school, and I really felt that I could really contribute. And God said, I'm going to create an opportunity for you to come back. And because um, Pacific Rim Christian College at the time, and still remains today as New York Christian College, the only national accredited Christian college in Hawaii. And there was something so important about that that God had called me once again to renew my call 
to, to come back here and to help build this college once again. And I remember really saying to the Lord, Lord, what, wh why is this possible? Can you confirm this? Can you confirm this in my life? And God waited until the last day of my retreat. And as we were in the car, leaving the retreat center, having asked for confirmation, there was a huge wooden gate in which the, your, the cars exited. And on the gate, at the top of the gate, carved in wood, was the verse Philippians 1.6. I bet you want to know what that verse is. Take a look at your notes, because we're going to read it together. This was carved on that gate. Ready? Go. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And God just affirmed it to me. He said, you know, Randy, I started the college. You were part of the start. Now you're going to get to complete it. But not you. I'm going to use you through you. I'm going to complete the work. Because it's all about what God can do in you and what God can do through you. And when I saw that verse, I mean, I was just so moved as we were driving the car, exiting this prayer retreat center where I felt God was speaking to me. And he says, the good work I began in you, I'm going to complete it. I began a good work, and now I'm going to complete it. And so that has happened. I'm so proud and honored to tell you that in two weeks, we're going to graduate 22 graduates from New Hope Christian College. These are students. That, that deserves an applause. Let's take a These are students and graduates that, that will go on to plant churches. They will become missionaries. They'll be chaplains. They'll, they'll, they'll work in ministry, and some of them will work even in the marketplace to have an influence for Jesus Christ there. That's what happens. God is still completing his work, but it was a humble start. It was a sacred beginning. God was there from the Alpha and the Omega. And that's his promise to me, to us, and that's his promise to you. That God is there because he really wants us to become fruitful in who we are. Let's read 1 Timothy 4. In fact, let me just read it and you just follow um, what is going on here. The context is that this is Paul talking to Timothy, a younger person. And these are Paul's words to Timothy. For to this end, we toil and struggle because we have our hope set on the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. These are the things you must insist on and teach. Let no one despise, that word despise in Greek, kataphroneia, your youth, I'll speak to that in a second. But set the believers an example in speech and conduct, in love and faith and purity. These are the encouraging words that Paul is using to mentor Timothy and saying, let no one despise your youth, kataphroneia. That word literally means do not let anyone belittle or give little attention or disregard or minimalize or diminish the, your youth. In other words, I have given you your youth. Don't diminish it. And the word for us is, it's not just about age. We are all young in some way. Some of you have just come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Some of you are new to ministry. Some of you are new to leadership and what it means to be discipled. Wherever you are, it has less to do with age and everything to do with your maturity in Christ. And God is saying, don't diminish your youth because that's a sacred beginning for you that I'm going to use and I'm going to bless that sacred beginning, yes, it could be a humble start. You may not think much of it, but it's a start. And I'm there in the beginning. Now, what's going to happen next? You're going to have confidence in God. Because God will teach you and show you that your confidence is not in your self-confidence. You know, this is not about some kind of thinking that says, you know, pull your bootstraps up, you know, just look at yourself, suck it up, and just, you know, just think positively. That's not what is scriptural. Your confidence has got to be in Jesus Christ, in God. And you put your confidence in God. So it's less about you and your strength because heaven knows we're weak in our confidence because we have all those doubts. We have weaknesses. We succumb to temptation. We don't know how it is sometimes to even live faithfully. But God says, but don't give up your confidence in me because I'm the one for you to place your confidence in. Let's not, God, let's not get that confused. But here's the next step. Here's what's going to happen. This is point number two. You will grow and bear fruit. So write that in. Here's the second benefit 
of having these humble starts. You will grow and bear fruit. These are two separate steps along the way. You're going to grow, and if that growth is in health, then you will bear fruit that's there. You know, last month I was in Israel with a study group uh, from the college, and we're, we're looking at spring. Spring in Israel is wonderful because what happens is that you have all of these flowers, wild flowers, wild, you know, plants that grow all over the place. And when we were there last month, it was the hillside was proliferated with these yellow flowers. And I asked, you know, what's the yellow flowers? Well, if you look up closely and, and you look at the yellow flower, it's got tiny little seeds in it. This is the mustard flower. And those tiny little seeds were mustard seeds. And I could immediately imagine Jesus with his disciples looking at this, the whole hillside of yellow flowers with the little mustard seed and, and Jesus leveraging that to say, do you know what? I'm going to teach you about this little mustard seed. It's a little teeny tiny little seed. You can hardly see it, in fact. And Jesus is saying, I want to tell you something. There's a spiritual lesson in this mustard seed. Well, what, what is that spiritual lesson? It comes from Matthew. Listen as I read. Here is another illustration Jesus used. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed planted in a field. It is the smallest of seeds, but it becomes the largest of garden plants. It grows into a tree so huge that birds come and make nests in its branches. That's quite a tree for that to happen. It reminds me of the time, I don't know whether you know this, but if, if you've heard of Queen Kahumanu Elementary School, it's right there in Makiki, and it's the school on your left as you're going up Piakoi, as you're going to the freeway entrance. Well, there's some huge trees that are on the side. I'm here to tell you that one of those trees, I know one in particular, the last one to the end, is my fourth grade class planted that tree on Arbor Day when I was in the fourth grade. That was in... Um, 1868 or something like that. I forget, it was some time ago. But I'm here to tell you, I was there when we planted it, and, and I think that the shrub was about this, this high, and it was like, you know, it looked like a weed, looked like a grass, and we planted it, and we and put water, and it practically drawn it out, and then we stepped back as a class, and I remember saying, that ain't going to grow into a tree. Are you kidding? Well, it did. <laughs> it's a huge tree now. In fact, I was there, true story, I was there a couple of months ago, I'm driving, and I noticed what the tree was, and, and it's so huge now that they actually built this wooden, little wooden bench around it, and I saw a kid resting there in the shade. And I rolled down my window and said, hey, you better appreciate the shade because I planted that tree. <laughs> okay, I didn't actually say it, but I thought it. <laughs> you would have thought I was crazy. But I thought, there it is, this little shrub, the smallest of, tree, of shrubs. It became this tree, and this, this, I was so happy and delighted that this kid didn't know who planted it, but he was enjoying the shade of it, which is absolutely amazing. And Jesus uses this example for us to speak symbolically and metaphorically about our lives. That, and here's what it is. He has planted within each one of us a mustard seed, a seed that's going to take some growing. And what we need to now apply is what I call a mustard seed faith. It might be a small faith, but it's there in the beginning. You might be new or might be doubting about this whole Christianity thing and who Jesus is and what the Bible is and all of that, but you have faith. Otherwise, you wouldn't be listening to me nor here today. There's something there. That's the small beginning. That's the sacred beginning. Don't ever despise that because God's promise in his word is that that mustard seed is going to grow into a tree where birds can come and nest in it. That's how huge it's going to become. But we all have to start small. God can complete something. He can grow something that, doesn't, that is not planted first into your hearts. So what is it in your hearts that God has planted? Maybe God has planted for you perhaps a, a burden to pray for someone in your family, your neighbor, a co-worker. Maybe God has planted with you something to really go out in, in mission and to, to serve the community in some way. Maybe has, God has planted you a mis, um, maybe a vision to go to another country or to be involved in, in a ministry that makes sense. Maybe it's, God has planted you a vision to fight poverty or human trafficking 
whatever it is that God has planted in you, that's your mustard seed. Don't diminish the fact. Don't cataphronia the fact. Don't despise the fact that it's still small. That's how it all starts. This could very well be a mustard seed season for you. You may not see it right away. You never do. But God is saying, be faithful, and I will water it, God says. I will bring growth to it. You know, there's a tiny little city called Colossae. Colossae is a city in western Turkey. During the time of the Apostle Paul, it was the, probably one of the most insignificant cities of the time. The Roman Empire didn't even invest in it like they did like in, in Ephesus and some of these other big cities. No, it was a small city, insignificant city. So insignificant that there is no written record that the Apostle Paul even went to visit this city. So what are, what's your point, Randy? What are you saying? What I'm saying is that Colossae was a mustard seed city. It was small, insignificant. No one thought anything about it except Paul because you know what Paul did? He found out about what was going on in the city. He found out there were people who were followers of Jesus Christ in the city. He found out that he could do something to encourage them, but he never visited them. Instead, what did he do? He sent them an email. Okay, he wrote them a letter. He simply wrote them a letter, and today that letter is in your Bible. It's called the book of Colossians. And when he wrote to the Christians at Colossae, he said to them a word that spoke into, your, into their hearts. This is what he said. Follow with me as I read. So you have, we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. Yeah, read it together. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit all the while you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. Isn't that amazing? Here it is. God is saying through Paul to this little insignificant city, I've been praying for you. You're going to be growing. You're going to be producing well. You'll, you'll have a fruitful time together in your ministry. There could not have been any less important letter to a less important city at a less important time. But here's the good news. Here's the omega about Colossae. Today in biblical studies, the book of Colossians stands as the most distinct, the strongest, the definitive statement of the mission and identity of Jesus Christ. From creation to today. Isn't that amazing? And you have that book with you in your Bibles. Humble start sacred beginnings that God has blessed all the way to, to today that we have this book. So you will grow and you will bear fruit. And then finally, I want to tell you about the person that had a humble start and that's Jesus Christ. We all know about his humble beginnings, born in a manger, fleeing to go to Egypt, basically a refugee family. But I want to bring us up to when Jesus was 12 years old because at 12 years old, his family went to Jerusalem and they forgot him back there. When they went back to claim him, Jesus was in the temple teaching some people. He was listening and teaching to them. And so look at what this is. Let me read it to you. After three days, they found him in the temple, what? Sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Here's my point about this. Jesus was sitting. Now, why is that important? In Jewish culture and heritage, what happens is that if you're a teacher in that culture, you would be sitting down, not standing. You see, standing is a position of, of authority and perhaps pride and perhaps even arrogance when you're standing over someone. But in Jewish culture, what you do is you sit down and you teach and you listen. You sit down because that means that you can see each other's eyes and you can interact with each other. You're on sort of equal terms. And here you are sitting down. If I were a Jewish teacher, if I did this right, I would be teaching you now and I should be sitting down there. The reason why I'm not sitting down there is my wife said that I would have a hard time getting up. But anyway, that's another story. But the story is this, <laughs> is, that, is that Jesus taught while sitting down. And that was a gesture in his part. It's, it's a humble start for him. 
And here he was engaging these teachers. Of course, he knew as much, if not, of course, more than them. But here you have that. But this isn't just an isolated case. Because just before Jesus gives his, arguably, but the most important message or sermon in his ministry, which is what we call today the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, before he did that, we know what the Beatitudes are, you know, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted, etc. All of these Beatitudes, but we forget that before that, guess what scripture says? Do you know what it says? This is why I have it printed in your notes in Matthew 5. Let's read this together, our final verse. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain, and after he, then the disciples came to him. Isn't that amazing? After he sat down, that was the posture of Jesus when he delivers this most important message to his disciples and those that are in his hearing called the Beatitudes. It was a stance of humility. It was a humble start at the beginning that he sustained all the way through and everything in between. That's the heart. So what would be point number three? One of the benefits, the third benefit is humbles, a humble start nurtures a teachable heart. Write that in. A teachable heart. That's exactly what God wants you to know. He wants you to have confidence in him. And he's promised you that you will grow and bear fruit like the mustard seed. And then he says to us, even beyond that, I want you to understand through the example and inspiration of Jesus Christ himself, who sat down to do his most profound life-transforming teaching, that we ought to sit with him. And to sit with him means for you and me to have a teachable heart. Let our prayer be, Holy Spirit, teach us. Teach us what it means. Help us not to despise our humble beginnings. And I know that each one of you today has that. I want you to search your heart. I have some second mile questions for you to look at at the end of your notes. Do that on your own, in your quiet time, devotion time, do it alone or with others. But have some conversation around this because I think that with the encouragement of each other, you'll know that even though you may have this humble start, it becomes for you a sacred beginning. Let's all pray together. Father, thank you so much for this time together that you can teach us just the power, the redeeming power, life-changing power of your word. Father, let's take this and allow our hearts to be open right now to be teachable to your Holy Spirit. Bring to us the life it means to have confidence in you. Bring to us the life and fruitful it means to grow and bear fruit in your name. And Father, most of all, transform our hearts in whatever condition it may be this morning. Where it be a heart of stone with grief and disappointment. Whatever the condition of our heart is, Lord, beyond that and through that, give us a teachable heart. A heart that's molded, that's malleable to your leading and your guiding. Father, come now and bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, amen.